we got four people coming in, Joe. There's looks like there's. Oh, you've already got YouTube live. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Just so you know, we are recording this. We're sending this live to YouTube. If you'd rather, if you are a if you are a, um, a a participant and you're just coming in to watch, if you do not want your um, video shown in the, on YouTube, be sure and just close out your video. You can darken your video, and we will wait just a couple minutes because we're waiting for some more people to join us. It looks like we're still having people joining. So I'm gonna give you just a second here. And uh, so Joe, should we just, we'll wait till about 3.05, Joe, and before you mute everyone? Does that sound right? Yeah, that'd be good. Okay. Uh, YouTube's up and going. Okay. Okay, yeah, at 3 like, o'clock I'll mute everybody and then you can control it, everybody else can control it from then on. Okay. I'll try to spotlight people as I see them. Okay. Okay. That sounds great. So, welcome. It looks like we have about 38 participants so far. That's wonderful. It's great to see so many people here on a Sunday afternoon here in Texas. It's been a crazy week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hear the snow has moved up to the north. So, where, where it normally is, <laughs> we're not used to having it down here with us. <laughs> Uh, let's we'll give it a couple minutes and then we'll get started right around 3.05. Uh, hopefully by then everybody will have joined or getting close to 40 participants now. All right, we're going to be muting everybody so that we can get started. Uh, let's see, I'll just, I'm going to click on mute all. So everyone right at this point is muted. So hello and welcome. I'm Becky with Malvern Books. We're so happy to be with you this afternoon for the four way book uh, spring reading. And we're featuring some wonderful authors with us. Uh, Angela Narciso Torres. Uh, Kevin Prufer, Ronnie Terich uh, Leonard, and Reginald Gibbons. So they'll all be with us today. Uh, just a note for all the participants, if you haven't heard before, we are streaming this live to YouTube. If you'd rather your video not appear there by any chance, be sure and just turn off your video. And so it won't be there. After the performance is over, then we will uh, have a short Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions for the readers, be sure and put them into the chat box and they will answer as many questions as we can. So we're thrilled to have everyone with us. So our first reader today uh, will be uh, Angela Narciso Torres and she is the author of Blood Orange, To the Bone, and What Happens is Neither from Four Way Books 2021. Her recent work has appeared in Poetry, Missouri Review, and Quarterly West. She's a graduate of Warren Wilson MFA program for writers and Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, Angela won the 2019 Yates Poetry Prize 
from the WB Yates Society of New York. She was born in Brooklyn and raised in Manila, and she serves as a senior and reviews editor for Rhino Poetry. She lives in Southern California. Angela? Thank you, Becky. And thank you all for being here today. Um, it's such a pleasure and an honor to read uh, in Austin, Texas. I, I was telling Becky earlier, it means so much to me because Austin is the city in which I got married and had my firstborn, so lots of good memories. I'd like to thank again, Becky and Joe for having us. Despite the week you've had, I hope you're all okay and with electricity and water and all, all you need. Um, yeah, it's, it's a crazy time, but it's, it's wonderful to be here with all of you and, and thank you. Um, the first poem I'll be reading from What Happens Is Neither is a, a collection really of, of folk sayings that I grew up with. My mother and her grandmother were both um, in, in the science field, but they also believed in this other world, these, this world of superstitions. And this both terrified and fascinated me, but most of all, they, post, they, they pointed me to that other unseen world beneath this one, a world that seemed to defy logic and operated from another set of rules. If you go to bed hungry. If you go to bed hungry, your soul will get up and steal cold rice from the pot. Stop playing with fire before the moon rises or you'll pee in your sleep. Sweeping the floor after dark sweeps wealth and good fortune out the door. Fork dropped, a gentleman will visit. Spoon, a bashful lady. Bathing after you've cooked over a hot stove makes the veins swell. For safe passage to the guest who leaves mid-meal, turn your plate. The adage goes, coffee stunts growth. 12 grapes on New Year's, the opposite. Advice from the learned, book under your pillow. Never step on, never drop. Every rice grain that remains on your plate, you'll meet again on the footpath to heaven. You'll have to stoop to pick up each one. So the core of this book was um, losing my mother two years ago to Alzheimer's and then my father 11 days later to cancer. Um, and I wrote this next poem in part as a way to record everything I could in my early, in my yearly visits to Manila before my mother's memory was completely gone. Um, so this poem is called Sundowning and it's from my mother, Carmen. The sweetest meat clings to the bone, my mother says, knifing her steak. Carmen, silver's paid on my tongue. Mahjong nights, her mother and father gone, she cried herself to sleep blamed in the morning for her mother's losing hand, unlucky tears. The sweetest meat she begins at dinner, tearing off a drumstick. What will she recall by morning? Named for Our Lady of Mount Carmel, she pinned brown scapulars under our shirts, wet stamps that cleaved to our backs. Carmen, prayer on the breath. Amid potted ferns, she works a jigsaw puzzle. Bizet on the radio. Unable to sleep, she made me lie next to her. My brothers clambered the banyan trees. My legs twitched, a broken clock. Her kisses are guava and rust. She sings kundimans her mother sang, Sampaguita, dahil sayo, saan kaman. Sunday morning, puzzle pieces strewn on yesterday's news. Maria Callas on the phonograph. Carmen, citrine fire. When she plays the piano, the lovebirds fall silent. Alabaster eggs tremble in glass bowls. Afternoons, she woke with an urge to bite the brown loaf of my arm. The marks of my flesh faded by sundown. The sweetest meat clings, she insists, peels a mango. Amber rivers trace her elbows. A trail of l'air du temps wafts in her wake. I follow it to her room, dab the scent on my wrists and throat. Evenings, she sang kundimans, hatingabi, nasa anka irog, Carmen, 
Song of the Mangosteen Moon. Before you go, I want to give you something, she says. She hands me a thimble painted with a map of Cuba. We've never been to Cuba. In the dream, a sister pours rosary beads into her cupped hands. Upon waking, a dead wasp curled in her palm. So while the book's central theme is loss, it also contains poems about reinventing the self after loss. And some of this is captured in the self-portraits that appear in this book. And I'll read one of them. This one is Self-Portrait as Water. Why does the body feel more beautiful underwater is what goes through me when I break the glass surface. Levels rising as I plumb the tub's white womb, this second skin thinner, slicker, gleaming wet as a lacquered bowl, because the simplest of molecules, two H's, one O, love to love each other, cling to what they touch, how this universal solvent swallows every hill, fills the hollows of my surrender, most forgiving of substances, I resolve to live like you, to fill and be filled, to take the shape of my vessel, dispensing heat, displacing matter, lighter than air. So there are many ways of writing about loss. And um, one of the ways I've found that was very useful after experiencing two great losses last year uh, was using the apophatic, a term that simply means using negation to describe what cannot be stated in positive terms and was derived from the Christian tradition where it refers to knowledge of God by talking about what God is not. I first encountered this term in a class taught by Reggie Gibbons um, at Warren Wilson. So um, I don't know, we, we won't say how many years ago, but um, I, I little did I know then it would resonate so deeply um, when I found it impossible to find the words to talk about the void created by the loss of my parents. And then after that, the house where I was raised via negativa. The air in a room after a door closes. The grotto of quiet after the last clap. What occupies a glass when it's emptied? Two equal parts, the difference between. The void housed by a heart squeezed of longing. The period, the white after it. A name on the tip of your tongue. The earlobe after the earring is unhung. The no one at the end of a phone ringing. When a painting is removed, it's cream shadow, unbleached by sun. Um, so my last poem will be the title poem of this book. Um, when my mom was well into her disease, dad's best way to communicate with her was through his violin, one of the few things that I asked to keep of his. So uh, it became kind of a talisman for me of how music, poetry, any art can outlast human language. It's there for us even when, when language ends. What happens is neither the end nor the beginning. Yet we're wired to look for signs. Consider the peonies. One makes a perfect bud after months of nothing. Another's leaves are ringed with black rot. How can I not think end? How can I not say beginning? Leaves fall when days shorten because a tree must reduce to its tough parts, twig, branch, bark. My mother sleeps away the daylight. She nods off while chewing a spoonful of fish and rice, her head a peony gone to seed. My father calls to say she doesn't recognize him. Turning to him, she cried out, certain a stranger was in her bed. He played his violin till she slept, a leaf in late fall curling into itself. In autumn, chlorophyll disappears, canceling green from leaves so yellow and magenta can blaze. In my mirror, I see her, 
the smile that favors a cheek, eyes slanting in the shape of small fish we eat for breakfast. Trees know best the now of things. What goes on has been going on for centuries. Washing dishes, I rest a foot on my standing leg. A fork clangs on the tile. I rinse a cracked cup. I try not to think of endings. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful, Angela. That was just lovely. And uh, it is, it's so heartfelt and it's really, it, it speaks to me because of my own history as well. So it was beautiful to hear that. Well, our next reader will be Kevin Proofer. Kevin is the author of eight books of poetry and, um, and the editor of numerous anthologies, the most recent of which is, are The Art of Fiction, How He Loved Them, and Churches, all from four-way books. Proofer is a professor in the creative writing program at the University of Houston and the low residency MFA at Lesley University. Among Proofer's awards and honors are four Pushcart Prizes and multiple best, uh, multiple best po American poetry selections, along with numerous awards from the, American, from the Poetry Society of America, fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts and the Lannan Foundation, among others. His most recent book was, a lo was long listed for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize and received the Julie Sook Award for best poetry book from the American Literary Press. Kevin? Here we go, thank you. Sorry about that, my screen just glitzed out on me. Um, it's great to be here and it's really always a delight to, um, to read at a four-way books event with four-way books authors. Um, four-way has been my home now for over a decade. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna read about 10 minutes, a couple poems from this book, um, The Art of Fiction, which is a book of poems um, that I think spends a lot of time thinking about uh, how stories are told and, um, and what fiction is, what that, what that word means. I'm gonna start with a poem about a translator. Um, I went to this, um, I went to this uh, event at the university here and listened to a translator I really don't like very much. And um, he, he led, uh, he started this lecture off by saying, saying this, um, a poem in translation is like the dead body of a foreigner washed up on our shores. And I, I remember just thinking, um, thinking what a ridiculous metaphor. Um, but everybody kind of oohed and odd, like it was really meaningful. And, and I started to ooh and odd too. And that, you know, cause it sounds meaningful for a second. And then you think, no, that doesn't mean anything. So I wrote this poem, um, it's called The Translator. A poem in translation, the young man was fond of saying, is like the dead body of a foreigner washed up on our shores. Here, he usually paused to let the metaphor sink in. Some members of the audience nodded thoughtfully. I will now read from my translations of a little known ancient Roman poet, he told them, shuffling his papers, then looking into the dark, half empty auditorium. The dead body refused to be still. The waves loved it too much, pushing it onto the beach, then rolling it seaward again. And so it made its way down the beach, alighting for a moment or several moments on the wet sand, then bobbing out among the American swimmers. 120 foreigners in a leaking boat is too many. So the ocean fills with poems, some retain the qualities of their original language, but others sink into a new language. Here I am out here. I can see your oil rigs glittering on the horizon, says the young woman who no one listens to. Or she says nothing, clinging to the side of the waterlogged boat where she has floated all night among the drifting bodies. A few of them become tangled among the oil rigs, while others arrive gently on our shore. A poem 
that has floated some distance from its accident transforms. So the people ran away in horror when at last he came to rest on a crowded part of the beach. You foreigners in your many sailed ships, come join the empire, the translator intones from his spot lit podium. And the audience sighs. Here I am out here, says a little voice inside the translation, a voice no one, not even the translator can hear. The audience had come to hear a lecture on poetry in translation. And now the translator was going on about the ancient Roman tendency to absorb and therefore transform foreign cultures, their gods and food. Outside the auditorium, it had grown dark, a perfect summer night. The thousand vessels on the great black ocean glittered and loomed. And for days, bodies washed up on the beach. Now the American workers zippered them into vinyl bags, which in the translator's metaphor constitutes a kind of publication. But what is there to say about the young woman still clinging to the wreckage two days into my poem? A gentle summer rain prickles her skin. Here I am, she says, looking toward the oil rigs hunkering between her and the shore. Here I am. She is a very fine woman and someone should translate her. I'm just gonna read one other poem. So this will be a two poem reading. Um, this poem is called Fireworks. Um, It, takes, it comes vaguely out of memory of having set a field on fire when I was a little kid out playing with my brother. So, you know, there you go. Fireworks. They have all these little plus signs between the sections where I pause. I don't know if that is helpful. <laughs> I always think of each section in addition to the previous section and then there's like this invisible equal sign at the end. Fireworks. He believed that great literature was elastic, and by this he meant that it shaped itself to the concerns of each new generation of readers. Homer, he often said, is elastic. We cannot read him as Greeks, so we read him as ourselves and find in him exactly what we are looking for. Shakespeare, elastic. Milton, etc. You're going to do it, you said. And I said, of course I'm going to do it. And I struck the match and for a moment your face glowed yellow in its light and then I lit the fuse. His mother had died and later his father had died painfully so now he had no one or so he thought and it was a comfort that books might speak to him in ways that were intimate and knew that this was part of their fundamental design, the dead speaking to the living. And up to the heavens with the rocket while you caught your breath and the black sky ripped with color, one rocket after another. And oh, you said, as I lit each fuse, hard to believe the whole field would catch fire, though it was the dry season, late July, and the tall grasses took the flame easily. And mostly I remember running from there. God or his parents whispering to him through the pages of books, they spoke to him on rainless days, his father cleaning his boots, the smell of black polish, the sound of the brush, his mother turning the page. Don't move, I said, as we watched the field burn from behind the trees, waves of gray smoke that obliterated the barns behind them, the circle of flame widening, thus the field opened like an eye. And the young man looked up from his book. He had read it before, Achilles in the land of the dead, mists rising off the water, the smoking dead. What did it mean? His mind had drifted, his father brushing his boots until, darling, his mother said, must you do that at the table? And yes, his father said, holding up the polished boot, I must. It meant the following, the wind was strong. The fire devoured the field, then it jumped to the brush by the barn, then to the barn itself, which caught fire quickly, and a single horse cowered among the hay bales, its oily hair glowing bluely as the flames approached it. 
Calm down, you said. No one will know a thing. We have to get out of here is all. And then we were running toward the car. By God, I'd rather slave on earth for another man, some dirt poor tenant farmer who scrapes to keep alive than rule down here over all the breathless dead, said Achilles from the burning fields. His father caught beneath the tractor's tired gas once more then relaxed in the field. And now the young man was alone looking over the field that in another part of this poem I burned with my friend. And who could account for such desolation, reading a book by the window, parentless and alone, dry fields, perturbed by wind and sunlight. And then the horse burst through the barn doors and galloped into the field next door, its flaming body glowing orange and blue in the night. And it set that field afire too, before it stumbled once, twice, and fell smoking onto its side. And in this way, the young man thought, laying down his book while his father put his boots away and his mother sighed. And in this way, literature is handed on from one generation to the next. Thank you. Wow, that was terrifying. That was wonderful and terrifying. <laughs> Living with, uh, you know, in Texas and the, our wildfires that take off so quickly, it's uh, as many places in the United States. It was a amazing poem and terrifying and beautiful. Thank you very much. Just a reminder that we do have four-way books at Malvern Books. If anyone would like to purchase these, uh, you can feel free to call us uh, at 512-322-2097. And Joe Bratcher, the owner of Malvern, is there right now that you can order your books, if you can pick them up curbside, or we can ship throughout the US. Um, now, uh, also, just a reminder, after our readers will uh, finish their readings, we, do, we will be taking uh, questions and answers. If you'd like to put your questions into the chat box, they'll answer as many as they can afterward. Our next reader, we're very pleased to welcome Rodney Tarich, uh Leonard. And uh, Rodney was born in Nixburg, Alabama. He's an Air Force veteran who served during the Gulf War, and his society profiles and poems have appeared in numerous publications, including Southern Humanities Review, Red River Review, The Huffington Post, Bomb Magazine, Four Way Review, The New York Times, Village Voice, etc. Uh, he was also in a, an anthology for Colored Boys, which was edited by Kev, uh, Keith Boyton, Boykin. Uh, Sweet Gum and Lightning is his debut collection of poetry uh, from Four Way Books. He holds degrees from the New School. Uh, he's a Kalaloo uh, Poetry Fellow and received an MFA in poetry from Columbia University. He currently lives uh, in Manhattan. Rodney, if you would join us, please. I hope you can <laughs> unmute yourself. Perfect. Good evening to everyone. Uh, I am Rodney Terrence Leonard. I want to first of all say, um, uh, thank you to Malvern Books for this kind invitation and my gratitude to Four Way Books and to all the other readers and to all of you in the audience. So here's, here's a picture of my, my little boo, my little baby, Sweet Gum and Lightning, which I'm so excited about. So I, I'll try to get through three poems, maybe four, depending on the time. So welcome. The book uh, really nods to origins. Um, and this first poem that I will read is in celebration of the thrivability of a particular, a kind of specific expression. The poem is titled, Language Beside the Language. In the first place, I come from baguette and banounce, bays and bath water, from chillin, Pitiation and Clapho God. From Coosa County, y'all, dim and nim. Dim mine, ain't, big mama nim. From stinking and breath, little bit mo. From sosh it, when is, avoid to popo. From daddy, 
Ainy, that there, and Froon, who got the body, what time the Froon ear, from Valentine's, Feets, Taters, and Okri, from Coveralls, and my stomach toe up, from Yumda, Goodmonia, Spencer's things, from Draws, and how come Miss Ruth so observative? From certificate, sedity, Rifa and diploma, from Scringe, prescription, strawberry bloomers, from done fell out at the house peel. Better go on now and eat them grits. From this here, my house, get your finger out of my face. From got my check, they cut me real bad. From Fourth Sunday meeting from appreciation ought to be gill when the church is full. <laughs> oh, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm so delighted that I live long enough to write a poem like that. Uh, it's such a nod to origins. And my next poem, um, uh, today is Nina Simone's birthday. The singer pen is Nina Simone's it's a birthday. And Nina Simone is my muse. Uh, she was my muse during her lifetime. And the only thing I tell you about this poem is that the title is borrowed from uh, that Liz Garbus biopic of Nina Simone. Uh, it was titled, What, uh, what Happened, Miss Simone? So in the title, I, I, I use some of that. And to me, one other thing, this poem kind of goes through a day in the lives of, of Nina Simone. And once again, welcome. If you have some wine, you can have some wine. You know, you know, you could, you know, you could do these things, as you know. So 2 June 2001, before what happened, Miss Simone. Too big a cat to be called a kitten. Nowadays, hiring help to dial up quirks and commands, interviews, canceled concerts, defunct royalties, noise complaints, restraining orders, pool maintenance, lab results. In English, in Carrie Lerue. Introducing Eunice Kathleen Wayman, gowning the pains of others. Don't you pay them no mind. Mississippi goddamn. Another champagne flute hurled and shattered. Doll, years beyond hyacinth. I know you know, this is not a muscadine city. Everybody don't love you. Young, gifted, and Black, and Jim Crow are on iTunes. Pardon my tone. You don't want to meet your papa drunk. 2 p.m., 57 East 57th Street. I bet you a sumo wrestler siesta Someone got her second order right. Armand de Brignon, Blanc de Blanc, D-Stem strawberries, honeydew, kale and mustard greens, champignon soup, basmati rice, Verdame Grosvenor's fried chicken. Sweet talk. I'm ready. Light my cigarette. Cayenne and Honey in the Darjeeling, please. They told Bobby Womack he wasn't commercial, commercial, commercial. No, you're not commercial. My set lists are mine and not set to hell with commercial. Is Billy Preston still alive and playing the piano, Clifton? Draw the curtains. I must rest before the applause. 8 p.m. Hep to chafe. I scan my wonder 
apneic as steamed mascara. Row to row spaghetti straps, jeans and suspenders prevail. I wear black linen. This day in 1989, I graduated high school. Gussied in silver and lilac, Miss Simone greases the Steinway. Carnegie Hall is hushed to sniff volume. As for Edge, a horsetail fly whisk from Benin. Not without Langston, Lorraine, and I want a little sugar in my bowl. Under a cayenne spell, prim pianistry and rough whale blade and bandage, sleepless and scattered as incense. Feet betray bunions, pumps, and tims. Wide pleas for the desperate ones. The moon belches for two encores. <laughs> oh, wow. You know, I really miss Nina a lot, but thankfully she was wise enough and gifted enough to leave an amazing repertoire of music for us. Um, and I think I'll end with this poem. So what would a, what would a reading be without some complexity? <laughs> Which, and so I'll read this one. And, you know, of the many themes in the book, music and musical references are, are braided throughout the narratives. Um, and this poem follows in that interest. Um, I mentioned Kamasi Washington and uh, the pianist Mary Lou Williams. Kamasi, Muscadet, and Mary Lou Williams. In my head, rain really lopes and rains triangular. Cavity sensitive, but not quite oversexed. I prefer clean and singularly crooked teeth. Rarely does the old bay of flesh subdue wag and drool. Grown and habitual, I loaf my bark to consummation and lonely riffs, lonely. Long legs agape in a black man's home, the third date. We have six more minutes of Leroy and Lanisha, Kamasi Washington's brood astral bronze, plucky and white of him to ask no questions, though fits of wow. Not the alcoholic he surmised, my keen interior notions framed black and whites of blacks, stacked kente, nickel-stoked Schuyler bar cart, and ruminations. The utterance of faggot baffles me, keeps Christians in church in barriers of the mind, lowers expectations that Jesus can fix it, glad Jesus on the cross. Is interracial romance sensible when whom we're able to become is eclipsed by the history of whom we are? He sat upright and semi-tranquil through Kamasi, two rounds of Muscadet, and Mary Lou Williams. And on the edge of 1930s iron, my world, away from the world, my bed, he said, I am white when it comes to my money. It wasn't convulse or moon foolery. I heard white and money, and I saw money, Mississippi. Skin tight Levi's on the flat ass need more than lust. In my head, rain really lopes, 
Oops. Really rains. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I really enjoyed that. And I can so sense how you talk about the music being a, this threading through the whole book. And it sounds so lyrical that every one of them, especially the one that you talked about with Nina Simone, that specific one, you can really hear, almost hear a musical lint. Thank that. you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Our next reader is Reginald Gibbons. And Reginald has the, uh, he has the honor of being the only one of these readers who actually read in person at Malvern Books before all of this craziness began. And so we're pleased to have him with us as we are with everyone else, but it's a, a double honor to have him because he was with us before uh, at the store itself. Uh, Reginald has published 11 books of poetry. He was born and raised in Houston and for decades has taught creative writing at Northwest University and the Warren Wilson MFA. He has won four prizes from the Texas Institute of Letters for novel, short story, poetry, and book of translation. Reginald, if you'll please unmute yourself, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here, so to speak and to read with my fellow poets. And also I want to thank uh, Malvern Books, especially, and everybody at Four Way Books. The, all the poems in my book, which is called Renditions, are based on other poems. They're either translations, although sometimes a little bit free, or they're just riffs on particular lines or something, so. Lips, Hands, and Eyes, which I'll read first, is from a few lines in a poem, of, a poem written in 1916 16, by the Russian poet Marina Svetaeva, namely those lips, hands, and eyes. Lips that need no brand names. Hands that dream the score of a jig or await an escape into fugues. Eyes that do not close when they see hungry, displaced children. Or unpleasant paupers. Or beat up, out of tune pianos. Or books that are searching a dim house for a lit lamp. This one's pretty close to an original by Yehuda Amikai, the Israeli poet. I've just made some changes. Afterward, across fields of native weeds holding their breath and cows breathing, we escaped as far as a stand of slow fleeing trees screaming more and more the devoted hardworking ambulances nearly began rushing nearby began rushing away toward ERs and then to gasoline bars we lay down on our frightened raincoats our shadows among the oaks remained on tiptoe on watch in all directions we lay there till in moonlit midnight came more assault rifles shooting elsewhere. The wind winged away, gasping and hid in ditches with the surviving children. The ditches dug themselves deeper into clayey dread and dark ravines crowded up into our helpless thoughts and memories of earlier times of such chaos rushed through you. And then deep into interior, rifts of the earth, your innerness too fled. I followed, looking back, everyone's lungs were bleating like smoke alarms, but softly. And we keep hearing a command to forget, but to forget would mean not helping everyone survive.
this is a poem, I've changed the imagery, but I've kept the mood by Cesar Vallejo, the great Peruvian poet. A guy goes by with a long loaf of bread on his human shoulder. And after that, I'm going to write about my doppelganger. In the alley, I see a girl looking for meat scraps and orange rinds. Is now when I'm supposed to write about the infinite? Another guy sitting on the curb scratches himself, nabs a louse in his armpit, smashes it. And we're going to chat about psychoanalysis? A homeless woman is sidewalk sleeping, her foot's behind her back. And I'm going to meet a friend so we can talk about Picasso. Some other guy swinging a stick at my bones has invaded my body. So then later at the doctor's, I'm going to talk about investments. This crippled dude goes wobbling by with a big kid, arm in arm. And after that, what? I'm going to read the art reviews. Someone is shuddering in the dark, coughing, spitting blood. When exactly would it be appropriate to theorize the inner self? A roofer falls, he dies. And from now on, he goes without lunch. So now I'm going to invent some flashy new poetic effects. This diamonds bought and sold guy, he uses rigged scale weights. So make sure everybody at the opera sees that you're weeping. Too near my building, this skinny guy deals heroin laced with fentanyl. Is this really the time to take alien sperm and astral travel seriously? The old couple at a funeral crying as they walk holding hands. And what's the protocol when you're voted into the academy? Sitting at a kitchen table, someone's lovingly cleaning his handgun. What exactly is the good of talking about where we go after we die? A girl's run over by a local Nazi aiming his station wagon at her. And we have to hear about very nice people on both sides and not scream. A neighborhood granny goes by counting something on her fingers. And the biggies are saying, we must make sure the banks are okay. Back to Russians. I put this one together from lines from a few different poems by Marina Tsvetaeva. She always addressed Boris Pasternak with whom uh, she never had an affair, but whom she thought of as a kind of uh, husband in poetry or mate in poetry. And he, um, he reciprocated in letters to an extent. So this is Marina Tsvetaeva writing to Boris Pasternak from Paris where she's impoverished and ill to Pasternak in Moscow in 1925. I've taken a few lines from several different poems. Paris, Moscow, 1925. Versts, miles, such distances and distances. You and I so sundered by them, disposed at two extremes. We failed not to become, each of us, a world apart from the other. We failed not to become, each of us, a world apart from the other. Time strides on roads of time. Refugee days straggle their way here and can't go back because what was, where they began, where you are, is no longer while where I am, no place will be made for me by these maimed years. I've said farewell to the fields of Russian rye. 
where a woman may need to shield her eyes from fires of wood and blood, from graves, rivers, imprisoned outstretched arms, from any alloy of tendons and visions. I am your detached retinue, your mind. Gusts of rain splatter against my glass heart like happiness or misery. I still hear at my bodily outpost in this city of resplendent indifference, penury, a feral winter in the soul. You, distant but visible in the Soviet of poetry, which you hate. You, not inside their stanzas of ordure, murder, evils. Be like Homer inside his hexameters instead. Chant your sunset quatrains and reach toward me, reach like a train slowly crossing the steps here. Where my one hand, for lack of the best rhyme, the word that loves its discovered mate word, my one hand is holding the other. I think I'll stop there. That was wonderful, Reginald. I really enjoyed hearing that and it was a beautiful reading. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we do have time for just a few questions if there's anyone that would like to uh, mention anything. Um, I think that uh, we so I have some nice comments, uh, one that says jazz in your words, Rodney. That's really great. I enjoy hearing that. That's true. Um, and that's, we've had some other ones, uh, really nice ones before. Uh, that when, uh, when we had with initially Angela, somebody mentioned that they quoted again, her kisses were guayava and rust. And that's a, that is a beautiful line on that. Um, and let's see if we have anything else here. I know that all the all all the readers can see the chat box as well. So if you see anything, it looks like there's two more in here. A lot of people are thanking you for the wonderful readings. Uh, let's see if there's anyone else. Having trouble moving here a little bit. Uh, Everyone has loved that. Uh. <laughs> I'd say it's been nice to uh, paint in four different ways together. Yeah. And it looks like someone posted translation is the opportunity to build a new creature on the skeletal artifact of the original. Depends on the translator whether they deliver a corpse or a new life, in my humble opinion. And that's very interesting based on what that other person had said, Kevin. <laughs> Yours. Uh, and it is always amazing to me just that someone could translate poetry in general is just incredible to me because you have to be such a poet to be a translator. You have to be a poet and a translator and be able to get the same kind of feeling and rhythm and everything else in that when you're trying to move from another language. I find it incredible. I, I would have read a poem, I didn't have time for it, but I would have read a poem to answer Angela uh, because I had translated a poem by Asif Mandelstam with two just dazzling apophatic images in it in which he says, this is about love. He says, you can't unmoor a boat. You can't tie a boat and let it go loose if it isn't already moored. You can't do that. You can only unmoor a moored boat. And the other one he says is that um, you can't hear a shadow in fur boots. I love that. Yes. You'll have to read that sometime, Reg. Next time we read together, I'd love to hear it. Mm -hmm. 
I think we have a question on the chat box from Patrick Wilcox. It says, oh, well, there we are. Yes. What was the revision process uh, like for your new collections? That's to everyone. Well, in my case, I'll go first, you know, it was, it was largely collaborative because Sweet Gum and Lightning uh, was, was born out of my MFA program. So I had a lot of participation, you know, in thinking about the architecture of the book uh, and through the varying architectures and landscapes, if you will, I was constantly not only um, uh, revising the poems, but also how they seem to have been in communication with each other. And someone had also asked me privately just about sweet gum and lightning, and it really comes from my reference for the sweet gum tree and, and lightning, as in, you know, being struck by lightning, you know, so those, uh, you know, associations. Thank you. Anyone else? I see that uh, Rosemary Kinder has asked me about some lines in the poem in which Marina Tsvetaeva sort of writes in her mind to uh, Pasternak. Um, oh, I see. She just couldn't find my email. That's OK. Um, I've said farewell to the fields of Russian rye, even in English, it's kind of an amazing image. Um, but the one that really hit me the most, and that's why I repeated it is, we failed not to become, we failed not to become a world apart from each other. She means, you know, we should have been two worlds apart from each other, because then we wouldn't have suffered, or at least I wouldn't have this way. And uh, let's see. Oh, uh, someone else asked that they said they would, uh, Rodney, they would like to, oh, I think that you already addressed this one. You would like to talk about your title choice for the book. Yes. That was, you had addressed that. Okay, thank yes. you. Uh, Kevin, it's been so long, but I've never forgotten how much you give, uh, uh, gave as an instructor at the Frost Place and your ongoing written work, which I clearly have to catch up on. Uh, love that you tackle the translation boldly like that. What a great topic. And I think there's a wonderful here that says this reading resonated with me. It's a perfect quartet of poets. And I have to second that on here. It was beautifully done. And Clarissa from Four Way Books, uh, thanks so much for uh, getting these people together. It was a, a great combination. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you so much for having us. This is so great. It's so nice to be able to be together. It was really wonderful to hear from everyone. Uh, and I don't see you on this. I would, I would highlight you, but I'm not finding you on the top here. There you are. Just to get you on here. And uh, yes, so it was wonderful to have everybody. You had a wonderful selection. And it's always uh, just amazing to see the, the uh, quality and the wonderful people that you have writing at Four Way Books. You do a wonderful job of that. Uh, it, just a reminder to everyone that uh, if you want any of these books, we do have them at Malvern Books here in Austin, Texas. You can give us a call at 512-322-2097 or send us an email at info at malvernbooks.com and we're happy to have those curbside for you or we can mail them uh, in the United States if you'd like us to. Uh, so I think unless we have another, any other questions, it looks like we're uh, good. Any of the readers, did you all have anything, any last words that you wanted to say by any chance? I don't want to cut anyone off. Thanks to everybody for coming today. Yes. We had a wonderful, wonderful participation. At one point we had over 50 people here and thank you so much. This has been really gratifying to have everyone here. Uh, this will, the recording will be available on the Malvern Books YouTube channel. If by any chance you missed one of the readers, uh, feel free to check in just a few minutes and it should be available on our Malvern Books YouTube channel. So you'll be able to join us there and, and take a look at it. So in case you missed everyone or just to revisit uh, some of the a wonderful, some of the wonderful people that read. So 
thank you so much again for joining us and we appreciate it and everyone have a wonderful rest of your day thank you